If you have your Bibles, uh, I invite you to turn to Mark. We'll be in Mark chapter 9, and we'll read verses 30 through 37. I've entitled our time this morning, Who is or Who's the Great? Who's the Goat? Uh, who's the Goat? And, and I promise you, it's not an animal, all right? All right, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all, a servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we turn our hearts to your word. We believe by faith that your word was written by men who were inspired and carried along by your spirit. We believe that you exist and that you reward those who diligently seek you. We seek you in your word and we pray that you will speak to us through your word. We've listened to numerous voices this week, voices of children, voices of news anchors, voices of coaches, voices of politicians, voices of actors and actresses. But Father, I pray that your voice this morning to us through your word would have weight and substance that it would reshape our hearts and our lives for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start this morning with a little quiz. It's a one-question quiz. I don't want you to write it or say it. Just kind of think about it to yourself. When the New Testament describes followers of Jesus, what word is most often used to describe us? How would you answer that? Don't repeat it. Some of you might say elect. Well, that's used 15 times to describe Christians. Some of you might say friend, as in when Moses was called a friend of God, or when Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. That's used 11 times. Some of you might say saints or the holy ones. That's used 61 times. Some of you might say Christians. Well, that's used three times. Some of you might say believers. That's used 15 times. The word most often used to describe those who follow Jesus is disciple. More times than all the other ways were described. And I think that's important uh, this morning, particularly, because uh, you see it in last week's passage when the man who has the son who's possessed by a demon, he comes to Jesus and he addresses him as teacher. Uh, what's behind the image of disciple? It's this image of a teacher or a rabbi who wants to impart knowledge upon disciples who will then learn from this rabbi, but then who will then image him and, and their lives start to look like a spill over from their teacher. Unlike a college professor who lectures in a classroom, a rabbi would often walk from city to city and, and the whole earth would be his canvas for teaching. And one thing that's true about discipleship is, is, is when uh, uh, it's normal to have these categories that the rabbi would then explore 
and, and teach the disciple how to realign or rethink about this thing in a new light. And so, for example, I think you see a lot of hints that, that what Mark wants us to hone in on in this next section of his gospel is that what, what Jesus is doing is really is taking on the posture of a rabbi and he's honing in on his disciples. And what he wants to do is to reshape certain categories of their lives. In other words, we all come here thinking we have a, a, an airtight view around sexuality or an airtight view around money or an airtight view around politics. And, and what a rabbi would do is to go to those categories and challenge them and push them so that after he's done with us, how we view those things are now more aligned to how he does. And I think that's helpful because you see Jesus walking in Galilee, through Galilee, and he's in Capernaum. Rabbis would often walk. You also see Jesus teaching. He would walk and teach. You see Jesus starting to prioritize teaching. You're only going to see two more miracles. The one we looked at last week, and there's one more miracle. This isn't the time in Jesus's ministry where he's doing miracles. A lot of his time in Mark's gospel is now geared towards teaching. You also see Jesus telling them to sit, which was a standard. A rabbi would choose where they would go and he would call his disciples around him and he would sit and, and he would teach. And then he would use things from nature to illustrate what he's teaching. And Jesus does the same thing in our passage. He pulls in a kid. So where are we going the next several weeks in Mark's gospel? I think today Jesus is challenging how we view greatness. And he's doing that for the disciples. Next week, he's going to talk to us about how we view unity and competition. Then he's going to push us on how we view marriage. Then he's going to push us more around this image of importance and glory. He's going to push us more where how, how should we view our possessions? In other words, what Jesus is doing is building these categories, and he wants to have us realign our lives and our hearts around what it means to follow him and to let him speak into what we think about greatness and what we think about glory and what we think about marriage and what we think about money. Today, it's greatness. You know the, the passage. They're arguing over who is great. And Jesus uses this passage to show us who is the goat. And in case you're wondering, it means the greatest of all time. All right. So I want to first talk to us about this human longing for greatness. That's the first point. If you're taking notes, our, our human longing for greatness. Not sure if you know the name Simone Biles, uh, but she is a gymnast. And uh, she is the most decorated gymnast in the history of American gymnastics. She's won 25 medals and 18 of them are gold. She has two skills that are named after her that's going into uh, the gymnast scorebook. And so if you're into gymnastics and you do this move, they're going to say you did the bows and they're going to give you a point orientation around the degree of difficulty. She dropped out of, of gymnastics for a season and, and many thought that she's done because of her age and because of uh, just that, that she's done. Uh, and she proved them and us wrong. She just came back a few weeks ago and completed two moves, right? One, no one has ever done, male or female, right? Uh, she ended up, I mean, and she has another move she did that no other female has ever done. And if she does these two moves next month in Germany, she will not only have two moves in the record book, but four. And so someone asked her, what are you chasing right now? What are you chasing? Are you chasing more gold medals? She already has more gold medals than any other gymnast. But what are you chasing? She's chasing greatness. She said, I want these other two moves to go down in the rule book. And you know how she showed up at her last meet with her last name on the back of her leotard thing that she flips in? I don't know what you call it. 
But she had a picture of a goat head and rhinestones on the back of her thingy, right? Now, what was she doing? There were naysayers out there. You're not that good. You're not that good. And she says, no, you're right. I'm the greatest of all time. And she proved it on the floor. Or maybe you're not in the gymnastics and you've been keeping up with this Twitter beef between Chick-fil-A and Popeye's. <laughs> you do know, so I see most of you laughing, so you know what it is, right? But there's this, this feud that was happening. Popeye's has officially sold out of all of their chicken sandwiches for the next two months, right? But did you know how it started? There was this feud around who has the best chicken sandwich. And so Popeye's, un, they, un, they, they start this new chicken sandwich with a fried chicken breast with pickle and with a, a side of spicy mayonnaise on a brioche bun. And they launch it. And then meanwhile, whoever's handling Chick-fil-A's Twitter, um, they, they, reach, they sort of shoot at Popeye's and say, huh, sounds like y'all are copying the original. So then the dude who, or the woman, whoever manages Popeye's, they shoot back, y'all are right over there, right? And what starts? It starts this war. Now, how many of you went and got a, a Popeye's chicken sandwich? All right, I see you. I see you. I see y'all in the back. I see you. I tried to one day, and the line was so long right down the street, I was like, I'm just not going to sit in line, right? But you know what they were feuding over? Who has the greatest chicken sandwich? Now, why am I using Simone Biles and Popeyes as examples to you this morning? Because Simone is chasing greatness. And if you went to Popeyes, you want to experience greatness. Now, why? Why do we want to be great? And why do we want to witness greatness? Why? And I know you guys get tired of me saying this, but I think the answers are in the book of Genesis. Do you remember creation? That God created everything out of nothing? And that the, at the end of the first day, it was good. At the end of the second day, it was good. At the end of the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day, it was good. And then he made Adam and Eve. And at the end of the sixth day, he saw that it was good, good in the Hebrew, which is another way of saying it was great. And then Elliot Green says what God did on the seventh day, he was sitting in kingly repose, looking at the wondrous things that he had just done. Did you catch that? We're made in the image of God. We long to be moved by greatness. And Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. Unlike anything else on creation, they were not like giraffes. They were not like the fish. They were not like the sun. They were special and unique, made in the very image of God. They were great. And so it makes perfect sense to me, made upright, made great, made very good, made after a God who takes delight in seeing goodness. It makes perfect sense that even though we're broken and even though we're falling, there is an innate longing to be valued, to be important, to be special, to be remembered. And there's something in us that wants to be moved to all. So I totally get what's happening in the, in the passage. They had just, Luke 9 tells us that, that they marveled at the majesty of Christ. So think about Jesus' fame and majesty like a snowball that's rolling from the top of a mountain. And every time they see a miracle, every time they see someone demon-possessed who's healed, every time they see these 
feedings of 5,000 and 4,000, every time they see him raise a little girl from dead and heal an issue of blood, that, that, that Jesus is growing in greatness and he's growing in majesty so that when you get to Mark chapter 9 or, or Luke chapter 9, they're just overwhelmed. They have seen this guy do everything, but something happened. They move from just appreciating the majesty and greatness of God to what they're doing in our passage. Now they're arguing amongst themselves, well, I want to be great too. You see what's happening? They're seeing greatness. And now they're arguing over, well, who's the greatest of us all? Now, we don't know what the nature of their conversations is. So, so just stay with me here. Maybe if you're Peter, James, and John, you had the luxury, at least in Mark's gospel, of seeing two things that no of the other disciples have seen. You were just on the mountain with Jesus when he was transfigured, and you were the only three who got to see it. And when Jesus went into the house, when the little girl was dead, he left the other nine at the door, and he took you into the house And you got to see Jesus tell this dead girl to rise. So I'm kind of betting here that if I'm Peter, James, and John, I'm like, y'all ain't nothing. Y'all scrubs, right? We done seen two things ain't none of y'all done seen before. We have seen something on the mountain that we can't even tell you about right now, (laughs) right? Because he told us not to tell us until, he, you know, right? Or maybe you're arguing over, well, he called me first. Or maybe you're arguing over, well, he called me last. He saved the best for last. Or maybe you all have been commissioned to go cast out demons and do exorcisms earlier in Mark. And now maybe you got a demon count scorecard. Right. And you're like laying this at each other's feet. How many demons you cast out? I got 10. Oh, bro, I got I got like 35. Right. We don't know the nature of their argument. But we do know that they're arguing over who is the greatest. And this is on the heels of Jesus saying he's going to die and them missing that and them talking about who's the greatest. Look, we might not do this with our words, but do we do this in our parenting? What, What do I mean by in our parenting? David Brooks writes, uh, he talks about the professionalization of childhood. He says, from the earliest of years, an alliance between parents, educators, and coaches create a pressure cooker of competition designed to produce students who excel at everything. And the family is no longer a haven in the midst of a heartless world to counterbalance the dog-eat-dog areas of lives Rather, the family has become a nursery where the craving for greatness is first cultivated. Now, I'm not saying that we're all guilty of it. But kind of are we? We dream of what we want our children to be. I want you to be a professional baseball player or basketball player. I want you to go be a doctor. I want you to, I want you, I want you, I want you. And what we start doing is turning the home that's supposed to be a refuge from that junk. It starts to happen right inside of our homes. Maybe you're a parent and we're pursuing greatness for them in that way. Or maybe if you were here a few weeks last week, uh, Zach and our youth department put on uh, a forum for parents. And one of the things we learned at the forum is how social media is changing our children. There are a lot of things that 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 creators of technology have done to, to make it addictive. And so now you scroll and 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 and there is no bottom. And now there's this longing to see greatness. And maybe it's your actor or or maybe it's your favorite athlete or maybe it's your favorite boy band or whoever. And you're looking for greatness. You're looking for the hair the right way, the body the right way, the right outfit, the right lighting. 
and we're looking for greatness. And then it flips us over, right? Because then we post our little picture and we get 10 likes. Now we're depressed because someone else over here posted and they got a thousand. So not only are we searching for greatness out there and it's a bottomless pit, but then we assign the measure of our greatness to how many people comment and like what we just posted. And if we get a lot of likes, we feel really great. And if we don't, we feel really small. I think our children are encountering this. Pastors encounter this. When someone finds out I'm a pastor, and I usually don't lead with that, you will never see me wearing a suit unless I kind of have to go do something that's kind of formal. Uh, I just don't like the people to get weirded out. When they hear my pastor, they kind of talk different and they just do a whole bunch of like weird stuff. And I just, can't, man, just, let's just be people, right? But usually when it comes out, well, how big is your church? That, that's like the first question. That, that is the first question I get. And I'm like, first of all, it's not my church. It's Jesus' church. Uh, anyway, or I was doing summer RUF once. And that's a ministry where if you're a college student, every summer uh, we meet in different homes across the city. And one of the guys uploading our talks, we had a, a planning meeting and he came back to our planning meeting and blank sermon was the greatest. How did you measure that? It got the most listens and likes. And I'm just like, really? It's out there, y'all. In my heart and your heart. In our children's heart. We're all searching for something great. We're all searching for something special. We're all searching to be affirmed and to be remembered and to be important and to be valued. The second thing I want us to think about it, what are some of the problems with the greatness we long for? Because of the fall, because of what happened in the garden in Genesis, I think the residue is still there. We want to be great. We want to see greatness, but it's fractured and it's broken, which is exactly what Jesus acknowledges in our passage. Did you notice that while they are arguing over who is the greatest, Jesus calls them to himself, tells them to have a seat, and he pulls a child and he sits a child next to him, and then he starts to talk. Now, what is he doing? He's correcting them. He's actually saying the greatness you're after is not aligning with the greatness I am. Now, it makes perfect sense, right? That, that if our greatness that we will naturally pursue, pursue in our sin is fractured, then we ought to see holes in it. And the first thing I think we can discern is that when we pursue the greatness of this world, I think we miss what is right in front of us, and that's the kingdom of God. There's a reason in Matthew, Jesus says, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear. He says, rather seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added to you. What is he saying? He is saying that we can work ourselves into a frenzy with our anxiety so that we go down this path of trying to meet. And some of those things on that list are really big needs, but we can go down this path of anxiety where we kind of miss what's right in front of us. And that's the kingdom. Did you notice that Jesus is talking about his death, his burial and his resurrection? And it's falling on deaf ears. How? How does that happen? Because they are so consumed with greatness and being great in the eyes of men, what they're really doing is deifying humans. What do I mean by deifying humans? I mean elevating the likes and accolades of men to such a degree that we turn the volume down on the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is saying, I'm the son of man. I will live. I will die. I will be buried. I will be raised. And they're talking about who is great. When we're seeking the greatness of the world, you can bet that we're missing the kingdom of God in front of us. 
when we're chasing the greatness of the world, I think we also miss who is right in front of us. In his book, Sensing Jesus, Zach Eswine tells the story of a man by the name of George Mallory. Mallory was a famous Brit British mountain climber. He went on the first three British expeditions up Mount Everest. And he's writing as he journeys to his wife. And here is one of the letters he writes. He says, if you cannot understand that there is something in a man which responds to the challenge of this mountain and he goes out to meet it, adventure is there and greatness is there. My dearest, I climb these mountains to prove worthy of you. And so here's this man who's gone on three expeditions up Mount Everest. And what he says is motivating him is greatness. Now, he didn't make it home on the third one. And him and his climbing buddy, they both passed on Mount Everest. And his son later reflected on his dad's life. Listen to what his son said. I would so much rather have known my father than to have grown up in the shadow of a legend, a great hero, one pursuing greatness as some people perceive him to be. Did you, did you catch what the son was saying? His father pursued greatness that took him outside up a mountain. And what he failed to see was that greatness was at home. And raising your own son. Now, why do I bring that up? Because I think when we're chasing the greatness of the world, we miss who is right in front of us. In Mark's gospel, now, now track with me here. Jesus and his disciples, they go to Galilee. Then they go to Capernaum. And notice what happens in verse 33. They came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, you ought to underline the house and you ought to underline Capernaum. Now, why? If you go all the way back to Mark chapter 1, you'll remember that it was that, that Capernaum served as the home base for Jesus's ministry, that the first synagogue he went to teach in was in Capernaum, Mark 1 21. He did his first miracle in that synagogue by casting out a demon in Capernaum. Then in Mark 1 29, he left the synagogue and it says he entered the house of Simon, Peter and Andrew. Now, it was normal for family units to live together in Jesus's day. Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and so Jesus healed her in Peter's house in Capernaum. And then the people flocked to Peter's home, and Jesus healed people all day long in Capernaum. Then Jesus left, but in Mark chapter 2, he returned to Capernaum after some days, for it was reported that he was back at home. And then in Mark chapter 3, Jesus went home in Capernaum and the crowd gathered and his own family came to seize him because they were saying he's out of his mind. And so his own birth family traveled from Nazareth to Capernaum to this other house in Capernaum to get Jesus saying, Jesus, come home. And what did Jesus say? These, this is my home. These are my mothers and my sisters and my brothers. And where was he? He was in the home in Capernaum. Now, why does all of that matter? Because he's back here in his home base, home location. And Mark says he was not in a home, but he was in the home. And we're supposed to ask the question, what home? One scholar says that there is a strong chance that this is Peter's house. That's been his home base in Capernaum for all of Mark. And more than that, there's a strong chance that the child that Jesus grabs and pulls to himself in Peter's home could be a son or a nephew of Peter. Now, let, let that kind of wash over you. 
if this is Jesus's home base, which is Peter's house, then you know what just happened? While they're arguing over who is the greatest, with Jesus in the house, not one time did it cross the disciples' mind to go get the children and let them come sit at the master's feet. I'd like to think that if Jesus were to come to my house, like right now, that if my son is on the PlayStation and my daughter is listening to music, I'd like to kind of think that I'm going to say, son, your Savior is here. Daughter, I don't care who you're listening to. It does not, it, it does not compare to the voice of the Savior. I would like to think that if the Messiah, the Lord of glory, is in my house, then whoever is in my house, you're not going to be overlooked. We're going to get around the Messiah and listen and adore him. But because their minds are chasing greatness, you know who they are overlooking. They are overlooking the children in the house because they're pursuing greatness in the eyes of the world. Let that wash over you. That's a picture of the greatness of the world where you dehumanize people. You start to assess value and worth based on if they're valuable and worthy in the eyes of the world. And in Jesus's day, we're going to come back to it later. I have a quote by R.C. Sproul. Children were not important. And so what the disciples were doing were brushing them to the side because they're chasing greatness in the eyes of the world. When we pursue the greatness of the world, we also forget the sobering reality that despite how much we pursue greatness, we will die, we will be forgotten, and our records will be broken. Welcome to the book of Ecclesiastes. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to come. I saw one given wealth, possessions, and honor and greatness so that he lacks nothing, yet God does not give him the power to enjoy it. A stranger will enjoy it. You hear that? Like if you really want to play this game of choosing the greatness in the eyes of the world, Ecclesiastes says, buckle up, you will be forgotten. It will not last. It will be fleeting. Here's a quiz. Who was the 13th president of the United States? Anybody? One person? Somebody, I, I, you know, some, somebody got it, but most of us have no idea. We don't know where he was from. We don't know if he was Republican or Democrat. Well, his name is or was Millard Fillmore. And he was neither a Republican or a Democrat. And he was from New York. Surely you're the president of the United States. Surely people will remember you forever. No, we won't. Who won? The MVP in the NBA, 2010, 2011. Brian Galt, you cannot answer this. <laughs> Who knows? It's Derrick Rose. Who won in 2004, 2005? Who knows? It was Steve Nash. Who won in 1974 to 75? Who knows? It was Bob McAdoo. What's your great grandmother's great grandmother's name? And where is she buried? You don't know. That's the point. We feel really big and really great and really grand by what we think we can accomplish. And the truth of the matter is when you die, People will stop coming to your grave. 
If you want the greatness of this world, Ecclesiastes says here, this is where you land. That's hard to hear, isn't it? It must mean that we were designed for something greater. That must work on us to the degree that it makes us see both the futility of what we're chasing and it should create in us this longing for true greatness. And here is what I, how I want to end our passage is, is through this lens. Jesus is all the greatness God is after. And the beauty of the gospel is he gives it to you. I think Mark is showing us and how Jesus is behaving, that he's the key, that, that he is the greatest of all times. He is this and he's modeling it. When we would pursue the greatness of the world that makes us go after the crowds, did you notice what Jesus does in Mark chapter 9? He, he actually says, they passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his own disciples. Now, let me get this right. He's just fed 5,000. He's fed 4,000. He's raised the dead. He's cast out demons. You do know Jesus could go anywhere in Galilee, and, and thousands of people would flock to him. But you want to know who he chooses? He chooses the 12 over the 12,000. As if to say, I see how the kingdom moves. I will march to the drumbeat of the Father. My Father has given me the twelve to love and to serve. He has called them. And though it is tempting to want to be great in the eyes of the masses, I know I'm going to entrust the good news to these twelve. They're going to do the work. You see, Jesus is counter to what they're thinking. They want to be great, and he is further locking in and clamping down on the 12. Then when we will pursue greatness that makes us only minister to those who are important, Jesus goes into a house and grabs the child, no disciple welcomed or greeted. R.C. Sproul says in most Western cultures today, Babies are considered adorable and cute, but in the ancient world when the mortality rate was so high that a vast number of babies who were born perished before they were five years old, a little child was not considered significant until they reached an age when it was likely that he would survive to maturity. And so here you see Jesus turning the way of the world upside down in the world, you dismiss children, but in the kingdom of God, I will not dehumanize anyone. There is dignity and worth everywhere. Jesus is pushing against their category of greatness. Where the greatness we're after misses the kingdom of God, the greatness Jesus pursued never lost sight. He oriented his life around the kingdom and at the center of the kingdom is a king who would come and live, who would also be a king who would die and who would suffer. And in the eyes of the world, this king would look like a failure, but he knew that he came not to be served, but to serve and give him his life as a ransom for many, and he never lost sight of that. He's marching to the drumbeat of heaven. Now, here's my question. What makes Jesus so great? Think about what makes something great. Is it not that you've not witnessed something quite like this in your lifetime? Isn't that what drives us to want to go watch Zion in New Orleans in a few weeks? Isn't that what drives us to want to look at Kobe Bryant score 81 points because we haven't seen anyone do that since Wilt Chamberlain? 
Isn't this what drives us to go read our favorite author's next book? Because some way they have a way with words and plot development and conflict and character development. We've not read anything out there like it. Isn't the how we attach greatness? It's to this reality that we've not seen anything else quite like this. Now, here's my question. What is greater than the cross of Christ? Nothing. This is God who takes on flesh, who created everything we see and enjoy by his powerful word. This is God who sustains all things by his mighty, powerful hand. And this is God who takes on flesh and becomes like you and me and who humbles himself. This is God, the second person of the Trinity, who is equal with the Father, equal with the Spirit, who joyfully and lovingly decides to come down to earth on a rescue mission. This is God passing through the very uterus of a creature that he created. This is God who walks on dirt roads that he birthed out of his own mind. This is God who goes to a cross to bear the wrath of God so that people like you and me who chase our shallow views of greatness might be counted righteous in the sight of the living God. Now you tell me, is scoring a hundred points in one game greater than that? You tell me getting 10 billion likes on Instagram, is it greater than that? You tell me if you could eat the crispiest, best chicken sandwich under the heavens, is it better than that? That's the point. Nothing tops the person and work of Jesus. That is the greatness your heart is looking for. Every scroll on Instagram, what you're really looking for is the cross. Every accolade you're trying to get, you're really looking for the cross. And this is why historian Philip Schaff, he says, without money and guns, Jesus conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon put together. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life never spoken before or since, and he produced the effect which lie beyond the reach of any orator or poet without writing a single line except for one phrase in the dirt that we still don't know what he wrote. He set more pens in motion and furnished more themes for sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, sweet songs of praise than the whole army of men, ancient and modern times. I totally get why Bashan Mitchell has a song searched all over. Still ain't found nobody. I looked high and low. Still ain't found nobody. Nobody's greater. Nobody's greater. Nobody's greater than you. Can you sing that? You're looking everywhere for greatness. And what Jesus is saying It's me you're looking for. It's him we're looking for. And here's the beauty of the cross. When we see it for the greatness and majesty that it is, you do know that God then conveys to you the greatness you're longing for. What do I mean? When you see that the cross is big and beautiful and otherworldly and by faith you come to Jesus, a part of what Jesus does is not just show you and I greatness. Do you know the ramifications of getting the approval of the Father? 
Do you know the ramifications when the one like and the one look of God the Father upon you in Jesus Christ, it will drown out 10 billion unlikes. Do you know how unique you are if you're a child of God? You're fearfully and wonderfully made and remade after the image of Jesus and the Holy Spirit resides in you. You're different. You're special. He looks at you with longing and satisfaction and good pleasure. And you do know that we are accomplishments in this life might be forgotten. But when Jesus says your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And not one single person or one single thing can ever erase it out of there. You're remembered. And you're known. And you're loved. And you're welcomed in. What would that do to us if we got a glimpse of God's greatness in Jesus on the cross and we looked at the implications of that for who we truly are? You're going to judge angels, saints. You're going to reign with the king of glory forever, saints. What would it look like if we believe that this morning? I think it would empower us to live locally. We have the approval of Jesus. Therefore, there are no greener pastors on Instagram. There are no greener pastors out there because we have seen the one who is mighty and beautiful and great. That should work a contentment in us right here where we are, where we can be wherever our feet are planted. We can be faithfully present and faithfully there because we have the greatness of Jesus. I think it compels us to serve indiscriminately. Our service is not for the likes of people. We're not just trying to look at people and size them up. You're a three and you're a five. Oh my gosh, you're a 10. You're really important. Let me run over here and serve you so that you think a lot about me. No, we can serve zeros, right? Because our service isn't tied to the recipient. It's tied to the response of the one we're serving. And that's ultimately Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, you better go serve some children. Because they, they're deemed unimportant. But not in my kingdom. I loved watching y'all this Wednesday. I don't see Zach. But man, to see Zach sitting on a dunking booth and letting these kids throw baseballs at him to dunk him up and down, up and down. I'm like, brother, that's Jesus right there. <laughs> to see Steve Lanier just like sweating and walking and lifting stuff and, and working kind of behind the scenes to see these men pull in these deep fryers and these grills to just serve and serve, to see people face paint and to, to do big bubble things like I'm out there looking the whole time. I'm like, man, Jesus is all over this place because we are serving indiscriminately. Had a funeral a few weeks ago and we were at my wife's home church. One of the mothers of the church passed. And I'm, I promise you guys, I'm not propping myself up. But there was no janitor to mop the church. And you know who mopped the church? Me. And you know what? It was not beneath me. It's not beneath us to serve like Jesus is serving. And I think if we really get this, we will repent frequently. We will see this human longing for greatness brewing its ugly head over and over again. 
and we can say the greatness of the world, you're not my master. The king of glory is. If he has reached down and saved a nobody like me, who am I to pass judgment on who I will or will not serve? May we pursue that kind of greatness. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and we love you. And as we come to the table, we pray that you would allow these truths to sink more deeply into our hearts. Amen.